Good. Pitch Goddess, chapter 32. <clears throat> what was needed in the house was a stable type, Gary had in intimated, to restore a balance of normality. Normality, that's a first for me. Banker was the perfect career for Savannah, and he ran the house with the fiduciary precision one would expect from a banker. Misunderstandings, at least over money, didn't happen. Gary had warned me that the, of the sharing attitude in the house, from the actors, of course, a one-sided situation, to put it mildly. Savannah was the only one, not counting Gary, who was gainfully employed. He was also the owner of the car, a monstrous, older, gas-gazzling Ford Galaxy convertible. No left-wing leanings there, no communist sympathies at all, except it was red. Savannah was generous to a fault and easily persuaded to lend the beast, which he often did. Here, perhaps, was our future transport to work in West Vancouver. There was no doubt Savannah had been at least partially sub sub subsidizing the rent for the actors. Generosity that they quite took for granted. They mocked Savannah mercilessly, which compounded his lack of confidence, evidenced by his bowed head and involuntary hard swallowing whenever challenged. He was no giant, but even his 5'11 seemed excessive for his persona. He spoke lacking volume, and invariably his sentences just petered out as if he had lost interest in what he was saying. Gary told me of an incident when Jude was leaving to, to go to yet another forlorn audition. Savannah met him at the front door. I guess you'll be cleaning the bathroom. You won't be cleaning the bathroom till tomorrow, said Savannah his breath poised, half hand half covering his mouth. No, I've got the kitchen this week. You have the bathroom, said Jude, pointing to the schedule on the wall that Savannah himself had drawn up. Oh yes, said Savannah, faking eminence with only minor success. My mistake, but I've just done the kitchen. Perhaps we could swap. Thanks for doing my chores, Savannah. Kitchen looks great. Keep up the good work in the bathroom. Remember, no hairs in the bath. Open sesame, he said. The front door had sublimated Savannah. With that, the swirling dervish spun away. There were many similarities to the old country among this group. This was not entirely a good thing. Entertainment Friday and Saturday nights involved gate-crashing parties. Parties like the one One's back in England, like the ones here when I had met Soren. It's easy to slide back into old routines, and this expat network had endless source, sources for party addresses. Invariably, some, someone would claim acquaintance with the party giver. Savannah embraced the system. It was the extent of his social life, and he operated it with a banker's tenacity. The system, however, was not without its pitfalls. Rumour had it that one party Savannah had gate crashed had actually been crossed out on his communal notice board. There was nothing else on that night, so Savannah ignored the warning where someone had added F dot dress. He took this to mean fancy dress, the English term for a costume party. His wardrobe lacked anything suitable, so he decided to go half naked as Tarzan, one of his episodic attempts at boldness. By the way, this is a true story. <laughs> He arrived at the waterfront house in beautiful Pilot House Road, Caulfield Cove, one of the select areas in West Vancouver. The event was just visible from the road through a picture window. All the men were in black. Could it be just undertakers, not a costume character, not, not any costume character? In fact, unbeknownst to him, F dress meant formal dress. Never mind, I've driven all this way and it's party time. So Tarzan swung blindly and only somewhat timidly into action. A total lack of timidity might even have carried it off. Rather a bad scene, he reported back in the next morning. A room full of tuxes and black ties, women in long dresses, and me alone, centre stage in just a loincloth. I was going to beat my chest, but I didn't seem like a good idea. I think I was the only one there who hadn't been invited. Didn't stay long. 
Savannah's worst problem that he was a whiner. Nothing was so agreeable that it couldn't be whined over. You name it, he'd whine over it. Invariably, the laments were about chores not completed as per his posted schedule. Gary lightheartedly parodied Lady Macbeth. The gentleman doth protest too much, he thinks. Problem was, no one had ever told Savannah to pick his battles. Good advice when dealing with kids, psychos, and the occupants of this house. His criticisms, even when justified, were swamped by the ambient whining. Nothing was so minuscule that couldn't be whined over, like two bald men fighting over a comb. Invariably, whines featured past tenants enshrined in his memory for their wrongdoings. Morris, for instance, from the distant past, will never be forgotten for the way he used toilet paper, like there was no tomorrow. What a spendthrift he must have been. How will I be remembered, I wondered. Better be frugal in the bathroom. But for me, Savannah's hang-ups were more than offset by his offering me the use of his car to get to work. His idea. He preempted my asking, which might have been tricky. The only discussion concerned the time scheduling. It was like transportation to one's place of employment was included in the rent. My suggestion that I could drop him off en route at the Royal Bank where he worked was met with appreciation. You'd have thought I was doing him a favor, not the other way around. It was easy to see how they took advantage of him, which of course I would never do. When I offered to pick him up from work on my way back, his response was, that could tie you down to my hours. I can easily walk or take the bus. This was like winning the lottery. 